Hi, I'm Tanya Hall, and up next on Marketing Mavericks, we talk about the two-day VentureBeat Mobile Summit and what we're learning. We also talk about Omnichannel. What does that mean? And responsive design, why should we do it, and what should we know? All coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Marketing Mavericks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks where we talk about the intersection between marketing and technology. We're going to talk today about everything mobile, what's happening in the mobile space, what we find as far as the brands that are doing it right, the software companies that we love, and more. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about a, a report that came out in an, uh, an event that we attended yesterday by VentureVeet. In fact, our first guest is the vice president of uh, product at VentureVeet. His name is John Coatsier, right? Is that, did I say that right? Pretty close, pretty close. You get 10 <laughs> marks. <laughs> here. Very close, not bad. So we just attended the Venture Beat Mobile Summit, which launched yesterday. Um, and lots of great uh, information. I think there's uh, 180 mobile executives that are attending the event and some uh, great information. It's a, it's a space where we're all still trying to figure out how to move further into the mobile space as we do second and third screens. And um, you guys have some great information and uh, a lot of great guests, right? Absolutely. Uh, we had a lot of people there. It's awesome. The report that we released um, actually to kind of help with some of the questions you talked about is the mobile games monetization report. Um, and we, t we looked at 176 developers with 1,100 games who are published on iOS and, and Google Play and um, they've sold, uh, they've got about 300 million downloads and they make about $600 million a year. So they kind of know what's working. Uh, we asked them a lot of questions and uh, got some great information from them. How important is the gaming piece for marketers and businesses who are thinking about using mobile? Should they think about having some sort of game or gaming application? We've seen it in the way of loyalty and retention. We talked about that a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago. Um, but how important is that? I mean, should all brands consider some sort of gaming component? I don't know that all brands should, but gaming is important to every single brand just because it's so important to people. Um, about two-thirds of apps are games, um, so your ads are going to be running in them if your ads are going to be running on mobile. And about a third of the time spent on smartphones and tablets is time spent gaming. Um, so if you want to reach people, you got to be where they are. And that's one place to do it. We are seeing brands do some very interesting things in terms of helping people in games. Um, and some companies are bringing out, uh, hey, watch this ad or watch this video and we'll give you something that will help you beat a level in a game or something like that. That's actually been a very successful form of advertising that ties a brand in as sort of like the savior um, when, they're, uh, when somebody's meeting up against a tough level. So who are the big winners and who are the big losers? Who's actually doing it right that we should pay attention to? I think Google uh, was certainly touted in this report as not being um, someone to watch. Who's someone to watch? Yeah, it's interesting if you look at Google because um, if you are a game developer with fewer than five games making less than $10,000 a month, um, you are most likely to have a single monetization strategy, and that strategy is Google. Um, and you, Google has 75% developer share among developers like that. That's not actually where you want to be. Um, if you're a successful gamer making more than, a uh, game developer, I should say, making more than $100,000 a month uh, with probably 20 plus games in the various app stores, then you're using companies like uh, Chart Boost, using Flurry using TapJoy, especially using two companies in particular that we noticed among the really successful game developers. One is Ad Colony and one is Bungle. And it's no surprise both of those specialize in video advertising, which has some of the highest engagement rates as well as some of the highest revenue rates for game developers. So, and I would say yesterday you had a great panel talking about a little bit about kind of how to get started. For small businesses, I mean, should they consider some sort of gaming component? I mean, what industries are profiting best and, and the size of those businesses? 
Yeah, if I was a small business, especially if I was a local business, I would not do something with gaming. I think that's a bit of a play for larger brands and larger companies with a little bit more money to spend. Um, if I was a small company, I would look at, uh, I would certainly use something like Google because they've got very good local tools and a lot of people use their local um, search engines and things like that. Uh, if I'm a larger brand, then I would look at ways to partner with some of the great big games in there that are that are used by a ton of people and use some native ads in there or something, again, that um, helps people in the moment that they need that. So what are the best ways to monetize from the standpoint of gaming? And I mentioned loyalty and retention. I think that can be a great mm -hmm. opportunity to engage. You know, we've seen Starbucks do this. We've seen a lot of brands um, use loyalty and retention in the gaming space. What is the most popular way to use gaming right now um, from a monetization standpoint? So if you want to monetize in gaming, uh, the number one way to do it right now is in-app purchases. It's not advertising related at all. Um, that's the majority of revenue for games right now. The interesting part is, according to um, the Interactive Advertising Bureau, that is going to be surpassed in 2017 by ads. Um, and the number one form of ad in is an interstitial. Uh, between uh, like in a gap between a game, gap between levels or something like that. Um, so that's that's pretty popular. Interesting little stat. Uh, there's one form of advertising that is also very popular and very annoying. Uh, that's the banner ad, the oldest form of advertising that exists. And uh, it's both the mo one of the most popular and one of the most annoying ads for users. So, well, I was going to ask you about banner advertising. I'm personally <laughs> not a big fan myself. I don't really love it, but Shocking. it happens. And, you know, one of the things that I think we need to get better at, and this was brought up at the conference yesterday and is certainly a pet peeve of mine, <laughs> is contextual targeting, right? So <laughs> I may be using... Um, you know, some sort of um, location software or something that's uh, telling my mobile phone where I am, uh, but it's not really good at telling me what I want. It's maybe remembering something that it thought I searched for that I thought I wanted, but I don't need that anymore. How, how come we can't seem to get better at really asking customers better questions and making sure that we're targeting them better? Shockingly, we also want to have some privacy, <laughs> and we also want to not to have not to have companies not know too much about us all the time. Um, there are a number of companies that are working on great technology that um, integrate our entire digital experience. Um, so what we're doing online, uh, what we're doing on social, what we're doing on mobile, um, it really infringes some uh, what some people are concerned about in terms of privacy. Uh, but they do a great job. But we're not seeing that integrated in some of the bigger um, advertising engines like Google and those and those sorts of companies yet because of some of those concerns. Um, one interesting thing about banner ads, you said they were annoying and they are, um, and um, they're, but they can still be effective. Um, if you look at Flappy Bird, for instance, uh, $50,000 a day in February of this year uh, with one single little banner ad that didn't even fit the screen on a lot of uh, mobile uh, smartphone foam formats. Um, and, and yet with the, the scale that he had, uh, made him a lot of money. It did. And it caused him to actually stop, <laughs> which I've not still not played Flappy Bird. You know, I feel like I missed out on a whole like movement of... Uh, How can you not have played Flappy Bird? <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm still playing Centipede and Galaga and, you know, really, <laughs> really cool new edge games. Uh, but no, I still have to play it. So I know there's a lot of Flappy Bird uh, iterations now. So... Let's talk a little bit then about um, the challenges that app developers have and what they're dealing with um, and what marketers should know about that. I mean, I think, you know, you have to look at, you know, Facebook and you have to look at Apple as being two, you know, places where I think um, app developers are paying a lot of attention. What are the biggest challenges they're having in trying to create apps for um, in that space? Yeah, well, the biggest challenges for game developers to monetize are are pretty pretty clear right i mean you've got 1.2 million apps on google play right now you've got another 1.1 million plus on ios um so you're 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 one in a million and not in the good sense <laughs> um then again most games are are freemium so you monetize after the download and and if you're doing that in-app purchase uh, monetization only one in 67 gamers is actually responsible for 
a full half, 50% of your take. So if you miss that person, you're really in tough. So you do this, some advertising well to catch everybody else, uh, but there's challenges with that as well. Um, app abandonment is huge. There's so many apps that a quarter of us only open apps once, and then we just leave it, neglect it, um, or, or delete it. So it's really, really challenging to get the kind of game that, that breaks out, that actually gets an audience in terms of downloads, um, and, and then can be monetized well. What we've seen in our study is that sort of the break even point or the, the breakthrough point is when you hit about 3 million uh, downloads for a particular game, and then you become able to really, really monetize quite well. What should marketers or brands know? I mean, okay, so let's look at um, industries that have done, I think, a decent job of this. And you think of the sports industry, certainly. Even television, um, creating apps to, you know, vote on our favorite reality contestants. Or in sports, you have, you know, the Jets have launched an app and others have launched apps where you can actually track games and kind of compete, whether it's kind of virtual sports or actually following uh, real athletes. What industries are doing well in that space that we can follow? I, you know, I have to say I'm not a huge fan of brands creating their own apps um, uh, for the purposes of connecting with their audience. The reality is um, on this device, how many apps do I actually want? I mean, let's say I've got 150 apps there right now. Am I going to download the Wheaties app or the... I don't know, um, uh, the Citibank app or something like that. Maybe if I'm a customer and there's a reason for me to have that app like with a bank and I can interact with it and they can also then brand themselves that way. But if it's just a consumer brand, do I really, really want 20 or 30 different apps from those people? I'd much rather meet them in a game, meet them in another app where they're actually providing some value to me, doing it for me, doing something interesting that I can say, hey, that's cool, um, and 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 then get that that association there. Because I'm I'm to be honest, I'm not out there looking for a branded app to be delivered a marketing experience. But if you can get come into my life via an app I'm already using, a game I'm playing, um, a social network I'm participating in, I think that's stronger. Um, and I think that's a better way of doing it. It's not the only way of doing it. There are companies that are being successful doing that, but it's not something that I'm a big fan of. You know, and, and we talked, I said sports, and I know you, you know, you used to play hockey, right? Used to. I still play hockey. What are you talking about? <laughs> and still I've got playing? The seven or, I got the seven or eight broken bones to show for it. Oh, wow. About 200, 200 stitches. <laughs> Who in the in just that industry do you think is doing a, a good job of engaging? Because as marketers, we've kind of given the sports industry in general a, a tough time of adapting to social and really understanding how to engage audiences better, mm -hmm. getting connected at actual venues can somewhat mm -hmm. be a challenge. Who's doing a really good job in that space? I see the Vancouver Canucks a lot because I live in Vancouver and they're doing a great job. They really, really do a great job. When they post, when they tweet, they get they get thousands and thousands and thousands of retweets and shares and everything like that. They do a great job of giving an inside view and also um, being honest about some of the bad news. We've had a horrible season here. Um, as you probably know, you follow hockey a little bit, um, but they've done a good, good job of showing some of the good news that you've seen. You see a lot of the top teams around the league uh, in the NHL, also NFL teams, uh, Major League Baseball doing that as well. Um, I see some good things out there. Okay, are you ready to go on the record to say who's the best hockey team? Who's going to who's gonna be? <laughs> <laughs> it's me from Vancouver. I hate the Boston Bruins. I, hate, I love your city. I love your city. If you're from Boston, I love your city. I hate your team. What are I'm you doing, sorry. John? We have a lot of people that listen to the show. From Boston. <laughs> you, know, you know, that I was John. Be I gotta be honest. <laughs> no, I think that was Tanya. Tanya told me to say that. Yeah, um, yeah, no, no. Um, no so, they have the best shot. So, Sad. out of everything in the study, there's tons of great information. I think that we're all really interested in. Um, how to better utilize mobile, how to understand uh, the app space. And it doesn't make sense for our brand or what we're doing. I think you see, especially it's tax season, right? So tax day, um, a lot of apps in that space that are really helpful. There's, um, depending on your industry, and I think, you know, I mentioned Starbucks before because that's a really easy brand to say that, you know, they've done a really good job. But um, what what is it that you think is the most, the piece that stands out most in the study that people should pay attention to? <sighs> What we really see with developers who are successful and making more than $100,000 a month is that they 
are using many different models of monetization. They are not using one and hoping. They're not using Google and they're not just using one or two. And in fact, they're not using three. The most successful developers who are making big dollars are using between four and 10 monetization methods per game. When they're doing that, what they're doing is they're experimenting. They're trying. They're going for it. They're giving it a shot and they're actually being successful. Um, and so that's the number one thing that I think I would point out. Number two, um, look beyond Google. Um, there's a lot more out there and there's a lot higher uh, CPMs to be garnered from uh, some other companies and some other formats. Number three, look at video. Uh, video ads are doing really, really well. The two companies I already mentioned, Fungal and Ad Colony, that were the most common companies used by our most successful developers in the study, um, they're, they're significantly focused on video. And video ads have tripled over the last three years, hit something like two or three billion dollars last year in the US alone. Uh, so that's a very, very good option. One other very interesting point there, and that is native ads. Even though native ads was used by not very many developers in our study, interestingly, uh, because it's actually hard to do in mobile games, uh, it's not a content creation format by and large, um, we did find that NativeX ranked very high on the list of companies that helped developers monetize the best, which means that for the developers that are using it, that have found a way to integrate it into their apps, native ads are working very, very well. Well, if somebody wants to connect with you, if they want to learn more about the study and they want to follow you maybe at VentureBeat, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, they can go to VentureBeat.com for our news. They can go to Intel.VentureBeat.com where the study is actually available. Well, I really had a great time. I plan on being there again later today and learning more about and uh, getting some, some interviews and stuff to share on our show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it, Tanya. Absolutely, absolutely. Great information and um, we'll talk to you soon. Wonderful, thank you. Absolutely. Really, really interesting uh, insights from the conversation that we heard yesterday. I'm really excited again about following more. And this is a space that we have to focus on when it comes to multiple screens. And sometimes we also look at the software companies that we're using to help us kind of measure and um, keep engaged to our customers. One of the things that came from the study was that HubSpot, which is Salesforce, um, uh, you know, a software company now, is uh, was mentioned as a top honors for all around functionality. We have Mike Ewing joining us and he is the HubSpot service manager. And he said, uh, hey, there he is. Welcome, hey. Mike, to the show. Hey, Tanya. So um, I've, you know, we've talked for a long time. You've, you focus a lot on the commerce piece and what you're doing. You just got back. How long have you been back from Ireland? Uh, yeah, I came back from Ireland in September of 2013. So just about six months now. So were you happy? Were you ready to come back? Because how long were you over there? Uh, I was there for nine months. Nine so, months? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Great time over in Ireland. Uh, we're stationed in Dublin. We helped open up a, a, a HubSpot's first European office. Our headquarters is now there. Uh, great experience, starting with 25 employees, and we've grown to nearly 100 in a year. Which is a lot. And why Ireland? You know, why would you, th I mean, we hear about, you know, a lot of different places to focus on building up a tech community. Why, what was Ireland uh, hot on the radar for HubSpot? I think there's a couple of different reasons. Um, I think one of the major ones is there's a lot of talent in Ireland. Uh, there's a lot of great colleges uh, right inside of Dublin. And uh, it, Dublin's just become kind of a tech community where Google has a headquarters and Facebook has a headquarters and Yahoo has a he headquarters. And so it's really become um, a real community for the technology scene. So I think we were able to find a lot of really good uh, sales, um, business development reps, engineers, support teams, services members. We're able to find a great amount of talent there inside of Dublin. I've been a fan of HubSpot for a while, and I think that you have a great engagement um, software tool. How do people most utilize Thanks. HubSpot? What's the what's the main reason that someone would want to use a, your product? Well, there's um, I, I think. It, it, it is, there's so many different things you can do with the software that people do end up using it for different reasons. But the way that I find that people get the most value out of HubSpot is when you use it for your all-in-one marketing tool, where you use it for uh, 
for engaging and measuring in social media, uh, for using your email marketing, your email automation, for gathering your contacts and learning more information about them, connecting to a CRM like Salesforce to start to do some automation, uh, whether it's displaying personalized content on the website based on experiences or interactions that they've had with you, what are or some- if it's sending them the best messages at the right times. What are some, you guys are known for your content creation and that's been a big driver for you and helping you engage new customers. What yeah, is definitely. Your, what is your biggest challenge for the brands that sign up for HubSpot that want to use HubSpot? What is your biggest challenge in getting them to the place where they need to be? Yeah, it, a lot of times it, it's it's kind of like joining a gym membership where uh, you you want to get into marketing and you want to start to attract a lot a lot of new traffic and really get engaged inside of social media but it's but it's tough you have to dedicate a lot of time towards it if you want to uh, continually attract new good quality traffic to your website you need to be writing good quality content that's going to be attractive to your ideal uh, buyer personas or those uh, ideal prospects or customers so, so the time investment of creating those blog articles and then publishing it in social media writing good emails that would be relevant to them and creating the, the right kind of experience that's relevant to those ideal prospects so how does that lead to though, you know, you focus on e-commerce and you focus on the fact that you can actually make money doing this and right. not everyone has the bandwidth or resources or maybe they just aren't really good at creating content. But if they do, like what what's the way that they're using it to make money? So uh, to make money, so it's all about getting, and that is the whole point of buying the software is to get a return on your investment. And a lot of times uh, it's going to be vastly different if you're uh, a B2C or an e-commerce business or if you're a B2B uh, kind of a lead generation business. So if I'm looking at it from a B2B perspective, I'm trying to attract the most, the, the, the right type of leads into my, into my website uh, to pass highly qualified leads onto my sales reps. And that can bring on a lot of business. That's how you make money is getting uh, qualified leads to come into your site. A lot of times when a person comes to your site for the first time, they're kind of in awareness or an attraction stage. Uh, they're not ready to purchase f- your f- from you. So you have to continuously nurture them with uh, good, relevant, helpful, educational content to bring them along to where when they are in that stage of uh, consideration or ready to make a decision that you're going to be the company that they're going to go to to reach out for, for help. What is the biggest challenge that HubSpot has coming forward? What is the word on the street inside your organization from the standpoint of what do you need to focus on next to stay forward thinking as a software company? I think it's always, you know, you always want to look ahead and see kind of where things are going on the horizon. You know, a lot of the tools that we're creating today are just to help our help our customers um, do their marketing more efficiently, faster. So one of the big things that we've been working on is creating, um, we came out with a new campaigns app recently that kind of ties all of the systems together that we do and, and help tells marketers, you, know, you shouldn't just be sending emails out to your list. You should really have a central purpose to sending those emails, have a, an offer that 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 email those emails are tied to, and be doing a full um, a full engagement around that by posting blog posts, by uh, using social media, by engaging in pay per click advertising, uh, measuring all of your sources, using your call to actions. So I think that what we're doing now is really trying to help our marketers um, bring all these tools together and really measure the effectiveness of their campaigns. What keeps you ahead of maybe some of the other? I mean, again, as Venture Beats report, they're saying that you've got the most honorable mention as far as a software platform. What do you think sets you aside from other platforms without being like a sales pitch, but really helping uh, maybe the consumer who's trying to find some sort of software tool? I mean, there's a lot of great tools out there that I use, and um, I've been a fan of, of HubSpot in the past, but what sets you aside? <laughs> Um, I, I think what set what really sets us apart, you know, aside from being a user friendly software that we created to make it easy for for business owners and for you know marketing executives to be able to use, uh, 
What really sets us apart is our support and services team. If if you're going to use HubSpot to do your marketing, you're going to be using HubSpot for your email, for your for your uh, social, for your blogging, for your contacts. Whenever you need help, you can click a button on our website and we'll call you to help you with whatever you're doing. If you're ever struggling to figure out like what's the best sort of campaign should I put together or how can I really measure the effectiveness of my marketing or what should I be doing for the next year, you have a, a, a wealth of, of really knowledgeable people here that are just dying to help you do better in your marketing. You've written I think a, that's what really sets us apart. You've written a book on e-commerce and if somebody wants to check that out or they want to follow you and learn more about how to monetize better um, using social media or some of the other content creation uh, opportunities, what's the best way they can do that, Mike? Uh, sure. So you can go to our, my website. It's at inboundcommerce.com and you can follow me on uh, Twitter at inboundcommerce. Or you can uh, just shoot me an email at inboundcommerce at gmail.com. Well, thanks again for joining and uh, congratulations on being mentioned. And I'm still a big fan and I'm happy to follow you. And maybe we'll have you come back on and talk a little bit more about e-commerce in the future. Well, I'm a big fan of you, Tanya. And oh, I've been you. following you and you've been doing great. So it's uh, <laughs> thank you for having me on here. Absolutely. Talk soon. Okay, that was Mike Ewing. And um, I think, you know, HubSpot is a great uh, product. There's a lot of uh, resources out there that you can use. And there's the freemium models. There's free things that you can use. There's um, other types of tools. You know, I, Mike's a great person to connect with. And he certainly is going to um, offer you some advice. You should check out his book as well. Okay, next, we're going to talk about something that um, you may or may not have heard about. And we're also going to talk about some trending things in social media and what how that affects marketers. We've got two guests joining us. Our uh, good friend, Aaron Strout, who is the W2 OGRAP. He's a managing director and author, welcome Mike and or, uh, Aaron and uh, Frank Eliason, who I think we've got you in the picture there. there we <laughs> Frank go. Eliason, who's uh, over social media at Citibank. Welcome both of you to the show. Thanks, Hi, Tanya. Great to see you again. I love that your new show. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, so interesting things happening. I want to get to the Omni channel and, and what that means. And there's also some trending topics. I know, Frank, you brought up one this morning when you and I chatted earlier about what's happening in social as it relates to the airline industry, um, as well as some other topics, and uh, including uh, the music awards. So first, let's get to probably one of the most trending topics right now, which is in the airline space. Now, here's my thought, is there's uh, one airline company who had someone tweet to them that um, they were a terrorist. It was a 14-year-old who regretted it as soon as the airline company responded and said that we take this seriously. She's actually been arrested, I think, from what I read on the internet. Um, but that's pretty serious stuff, but it really doesn't affect, you know, we talk about it being social news, but that really doesn't affect the brand. I mean, right? I mean, we're still, I think, especially when you look at the airline industry, we um, we don't necessarily, we, we respect them, but we maybe feel safer, but we're still going to buy uh, you know, our tickets, and that's not going to prevent us from buying a ticket. We've seen that before with actually airlines that don't do a great job in customer service. You you travel a lot. What do you think about that, Aaron? Yeah, no, I, I think um, anytime you can have news about your company, as long as it's not something negative, and, and I think there was some other negative uh, activity that was going on, um, there's some pictures that went around. I won't get too specific and keep this family friendly. Uh, those are probably a little bit more of a, a put off than someone that's trying to keep people safe, you know, when it comes to uh, terrorist activity. And I think any of us that do travel and have to go through the whole taking off your shoes, belt, et cetera, at airports realize that the inconvenience of having to do those things is at the price of being safe. So, you know, I think we all make decisions on airlines based on routes, times, status, things like that, and unless there's something really egregious that they do, then uh, it really doesn't act as a deterrent. Okay, Frank, I'm going to let you address that second airline issue since you're the one that brought it to my attention yesterday. I was so focused on mobile and mobile strategy that I totally missed it. But as soon as I went onto Facebook, that's all I saw, and it was pretty disgusting and gross. But yeah. I, again, if I need to buy a ticket, is that going to prevent me? I mean, th one of the things that was mentioned in a lot of the social posts about this um, tweet that went out with a bad 
picture that shouldn't have been on the internet um, was that, um, you know, oh, you shouldn't hire an intern. You should always keep your social in-house. I don't know that, that that's necessarily the issue. We don't really know. I don't know whether or not this was somebody at an external organization or just somebody that was disgruntled or maybe just a mistake. But it's still not going to prevent me from using that airline. I'm not happy with it, but I'm not going to prevent buying it. A, a brand like City, you've got such a great reputation. I mean, how would that, would something like that affect your brand? Well, I think it comes down to, you know, we love to hate on certain industries. You know, I came from the cable industry. We love to hate the cable industry. Airlines, we tend to love to hate airlines. Uh, you know, so these are the things that go on. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily impact at the end of the day how much you buy. We could start going through all a ton of different social media examples of blow ups uh, that brands have had and how well they've done uh, during those particular quarters. There are some uh, that did definitely have a financial impact to the brand uh, longer term. The situation that came out yesterday, you can take from the example that uh, you know, there's a statement from US Air, and I wrote about this on LinkedIn, that is fairly clear. It was a mistake. It was an internal employee. They made a mistake. They were trying to flag the post, and it instead of flagging, sent out with the next tweet. Uh, mistakes happen. We're all human. If you've never made a mistake, fine. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, more happy for you. Uh, I think that's the key to it: is understanding that. If you're a brand like City and this happens, step back and go, what happened? Oh, all right, a human error. Not that big of a deal. Let's tell the world, here's exactly what happened. Let's make sure we delete that tweet because, wow, I, I can't even get that out of my mind. Uh, but, you know, that is how you handle it. It's not about going to fire someone, which is typically what we do. It's, you know, they, they weren't tr purposely trying to destroy our brand. Uh, and I know there's tons of social media people that would probably make cases for all kinds of things in this because we love to play, you know, quarterback when we can and step in and go, here's here's what they should have done. Uh, but the reality is, at the end of the day, it's not that big of a deal. You know, give your statement. Hey, it was an accident. Here's what happened. And shut up about it. Sure. And it will go away. I almost wish you had yesterday. I mean, I have mixed feelings about you even telling me that that existed because I actually had to go, you know, check it out. And yeah. I, when I saw that picture, I went, oh, why'd I go click on that? Thanks, Frank. Appreciate it. Um, okay. So, you know, Aaron, you've recently, um, and you've, you've talked about this in the past. You recently wrote um, a blog about it's omni-channel stupid. Don't adopt mobile-focused marketing. Here we are talking about mobile marketing and why that's important. We know that we're multiple screen now. We know that we're using mobile to not just look up where we're going, but make purchases. And we're really focused on that. What is um, First off, what is omni-channel? So omni-channel is a concept of really starting to stitch together all of the channels that uh, any online retailer or, I'm sorry, any type of retailer that has multiple presences um, stitching those channels together to have a better experience for the customer. And so it's a term that's getting used more and more. It probably will become, you know, a little bit too buzzy uh, before too long. But my message was, and I, I got a little bit of flack for this, is I'm not saying abandon mobile. I'm actually saying stop siloing mobile, just like you shouldn't silo other channels. And if you're doing the customer experience right, and it's apropos that we have Frank on here today because he's been a guy that's been an advocate for uh, the right customer experience, that I think that it will make for a happier customer because um, a couple of the stats I have here from a Deloitte report, um, excuse me while I just check my notes, is that it says omni-channel customers spend 93% more than customers that do online, you know, direct shopping, meaning catalog or online, and they spend 208% more than customers that shop in-store only. So I think if that's not compelling data for anybody that runs, you know, any type of retail presence, um, I don't know what is. Okay. We obviously shouldn't silo it. I think that's really makes sense. Are we seeing that people are actually taking mobile and coming up with a completely different strategy that doesn't fit into their marketing campaign? I mean, you really have to, I mean, where would you start? It's the same way we always have, right? Focus on your brand and your message and, um, you know, reach and frequency and all of these types of things. So how, why are people making a mobile different and a different experience? Well, it's not that, uh, I mean, the problem is, is that, you know, the way companies work a lot of times, 
uh, there do end up being these natural silos. And so there's a group, usually it's digital, they're the ones that get signed up and they're responsible for the mobile app. And I think I, one of the things that John at VentureBeat said earlier that I really liked was that actually a lot of brands shouldn't necessarily have their own mobile app. So someone like a city, yep, because I want to do my online banking, right? Someone like a Starbucks, yes, I want to have a, a mobile app because there's a lot of things that I'm doing with them. But I think in general, thinking about the mobile experience, so taking a big step back and, and sort of to your point, it's less focused on brand and reach and frequency and more about what is my customer doing and how can I do a better job at sort of interfacing with them, tracking you know, their behavior and not in a creepy way, but so that I can actually support that buying behavior, having a better CRM, which includes social CRM, right? So I can see what their activity is in different channels and put the right messages out and support them and let them sort of pick up you know, from their store experience and move back into a tablet or a phone or a laptop experience. Who's doing a really good job of that right now at, from an agency perspective and you look at brands, whether they're your um, uh, clients or somebody else's clients, who's really doing a good job of understanding where mobile fits into the entire marketing strategy? Well, I'll mention some of the brands because I think from an agency perspective, a lot of times it ends up being a shared experience because companies tend to have a PR firm, a digital firm, an ad firm. So I think you know companies like Starbucks, which has really been a pioneer in stitching together all these different channels and their app has really been one that um, does allow you to connect that online and offline experience very elegantly. Uh, REI, the sort of uh, outdoor sporting store, I think has done a, a good job, as has Cabello's, which is also uh, an outdoor sporting store. Uh, I know that they have a fairly big presence down here in Texas. Uh, but they're companies that are looking to really integrate all the information and all that experience and support that you know, buying habit of moving online, offline, having uh, nice, seamless experiences even across devices uh, can be really helpful and, and can make for a much smoother journey for customers. Let's talk about REI for a second. I'm a big fan. I'm a customer and I love their products. They have a very co-op kind of feel and they, um, you know, they've, they've in-store, good in-store experience. What are they doing right when it comes to marketing as far as mobile? Well, I think it's just, um, you know, first of all, responsive design is a critical piece to, I think, having a good mobile experience. And, and whether you have an app or you just use your website, it's streamlining down to, you know, what are the two or three things that uh, customers really want to do and need to do? So I think REI has done a good job with this. You know, I had an interesting conversation with Rick Wyan from uh, McDonald's about this when they were building their mobile app. And he mentioned the fact that, you know, the two things that people wanted to sort of see most um, when the McDonald's app were, uh, I, I want to be able to apply for a job and then I want to be able to find out, do you have an outdoor playground? Because parents like myself, they're traveling, want to be able to have the distraction for the kids, right? That's not what probably a lot of the McDonald's leadership thought when they first built it. So I think companies like REI, like Starbucks have taken, do the due diligence and step back and say, you know, what are the use cases for people that are using me mobily? How are they interacting with me in store? You know, does that change at all when they move over to their laptop or desktop? And how can I create the most seamless experience across all of those different channels? So I, the app is important. You know, you mentioned the Citibank and Frank Elias and you, I've been following you and your work since you were at Comcast and you mentioned the cable industry there for a minute. And I think you did a phenomenal job, Frank, when you um, started Comcast Cares at uh, Comcast. You really understood the customer service component. Now at Citibank, um, you guys have an app and you're over all of social. How important has that experience been in applying what you're doing at Citi? Uh, it's imperative. I think we're all a product of our history. But as you're hitting it, it's not this omni-channel. It's, it's not thinking in our typical way of thinking. It's thinking like a customer. It's that easy. This isn't very difficult. Uh, for us, it is looking around and having one singular app eventually for all parts of the globe. So we're in a lot of countries around the globe. Well, they don't think of us as, say, City India. They think of us as City. We need to make sure our technology matches up to that. But then the other component is it's matching up with all the other layers, you have mobile, you have your website, you have your branch experience, and you have when you call. All these things are together. They don't think of, you know, a customer doesn't think of them as separate. They think of them as city or city bank. And you need to concentrate on that. Uh, with 
everything that you do. And so I think that's the shift that you're seeing. So at City, one of the things that we, we just did, we recently made a hire and she starts in a few weeks. Uh, our chief marketing officer role is actually now going to be chief client experience. And it will include marketing, include digital. Uh, and I didn't say mobile because it's digital and mobile are together. And so this is how you think about it. And, you know, it, but it requires you to shift how you may structure yourselves internally. It's a global role, not a North American role or, you know, you know this structure is going to be what moves us forward. Uh, and so I think there's a lot going on within businesses regarding this. How are banking organizations like City, and I have some banking background myself, and that industry has changed a lot from back in savings and loans to banks of today, where it's a much more digital experience and they're encouraging mm -hmm. online. You've got Facebook saying they want to be your future bank. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, I mean, there's a, a lot happening in the digital space. And that's kind of an interesting development. What does City think about or what do you think about something like Facebook saying they want to be uh, your future bank? It's kind of scary. Uh, it's scary, but I'm not certain that that is what individuals really desire. When you look at studies, studies have shown that, you know, people do prefer banking. I think the message has been that banks do need to think differently and think much more customer centric uh, in what they do. And you know the belief is that maybe in the past they weren't doing that as much. So I think that's where you're gonna see some shifts. It's about ease of use, making it easy for you to do your banking, uh, make it easy for you to do it in the way you want to do it, not the way we wanna dictate that you do it. Uh, so I think that changes making it convenient, uh, making it easy for me to send you money no matter where you are around the world. Many banks can do that today very easily. I know, you know, we do, it's one of the most popular features within uh, our experiences to be able to share money easily. And so, you know, it is, we have to make sure we're constantly rethinking what banking is, but thinking about it from the perspective of the customer. And I think the more we do that and we make the customer the center of what we do, that's where we'll win. How important is listening to the consumer? Because I remember when, okay, so I'm totally going to date myself here, but I remember when ATMs, uh, gosh, this, I shouldn't admit this, but when ATMs launched and uh, they were becoming really popular and, you know, people complained that they wanted to actually talk to somebody. And today that's, you know, we don't really want that experience most of the time. We want to hurry. We want to get um, our needs met, as you pointed out. We want to be able to make deposits quickly. We want to be able to share quickly. And, and time is much more important. How are you listening to your customers' needs mm -hmm. today to make those things happen and uh, move the technology and, and banking forward? Uh, it's kind of funny you brought that up because I've been having a lot of discussions recently. You know, a lot of big brands are rolling out these social media listening centers and command centers and they're listening, you know, and there are these shiny objects with five TV screens and we listen to a customer because, you know, it's we have it on a TV screen uh, and very showy. The fact is, if you have to tell people or show people you listen, I'm not certain you're listening or doing it right. Uh, the key is, you know, we have to listen. We have tons of data. We have data when you call. We have data when you're, in, you know, using your cards. Or we have data when you actually contact us or you do a chat. We know what the discussions are. And it's bringing this all together. Uh, we have groups that bring together things along the lines of social media data, uh, you know, our insights from when you call, our survey data. And it all means something a little bit different because it's a different part of the life cycle. Our web analytics, when you clicked what and where. And so I think that's making us much more powerful in understanding what is going on and why people do what they do. But then we have to take it into action. You know, revamp the website, revamp the mobile experience to bring those things that people really want front and center. Make it easy. But the other challenge to it is you might want something different than I want. And so now it's also getting it to this micro level where we're delivering, you know, the experience that an individual really desires, not what the masses desire. And so um, that's the, probably the further challenge. But first, there's other aspects that have to happen. We have to bring all our systems in, in alignment. Uh, so we only have one iPad app or one mobile app instead of one for every country. And so these are the things, the fundamental functions that we're actually working on now but all these other components will lead to the future. 
What's the biggest challenge that you have moving forward? And, you know, how, how are you approaching that um, in the digital space? Well, I think the challenge moving forward is thinking a little differently. You know, most companies were product centered. We were too. Uh, and we want to be customer centered. So it's a culture shift. And, you know, I've been around culture shifts for a long time. They don't happen overnight. They happen over time. And you have to allow that time to go on. And you constantly live everything you're doing. Uh, as you do that, people will come on board. Uh, it starts with the leadership at the top, and I think the, the CEO of the bank and Mike Corbett and the president of our consumer division, Manuel, really believe this. And then it's bringing it to their direct reports and then throughout the organization. And we are doing it. You know, so we have to stop thinking of all our different little silos across the globe and think of us as one city and just just as our consumer do. Okay, Aaron, one of the questions that came in from our talk about Omnichannel is you mentioned something and I thought we probably should elaborate on it. Responsive design. Sounds really fancy. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that actually mean? So it's this newish way of creating web experiences that regardless of what uh, which which device you're on, you know, whether you're on your laptop, your iPad, your, you know, tablet, whatever, that it basically the design responds to whatever the screen size is, right? So uh, in the past, the way we combated this, like anybody that's ever blogged, WordPress has a plugin that just streamlines the experience and it's sort of a one size fits all. Um, so if you're on, you know, someone's website, you get a fancier design. If you're on the phone, it slims it down to mostly text and bullets. So responsive design, if you go to any good site that sort of has created responsive design, um, will open up and provide more functionality the bigger the screen is and will slim down and provide less functionality and more bullets and more drop downs uh, and also handle images appropriately. In some cases, it's evolving what the image looks like. In some cases, it's removing the image or turning it into an icon. So any company that's doing a good job, we just redid our WCG world site. Um, you know, if someone wants an example just from an agency perspective, uh, but it's really making it so that, you know, however you're viewing it and because there's so many different devices and so many different operating systems now and so many versions of those operating systems, uh, it's really ensuring that everyone has the best possible experience as they're interacting with you as a brand. Well, and that's a big challenge, as, as you pointed out. I mean, there's different operating systems. There's a lot that um, from a technical standpoint that you have to make sure. But you know, let's look at this. Like, so... I would agree. I hate going to a website and being, you know, it's difficult to navigate, especially on my mobile device. What are we seeing from the standpoint of abandonment? I mean, will customers abandon your product? I've done it. I mean, I've, I've ordered pizza. Yeah, pizza from a p different pizza company because I couldn't navigate through somebody's mobile site or it didn't allow me easy functionality. What are we seeing from the standpoint of actually numbers in that space? I, I don't know the exact um, numbers, but I do. I have seen numbers that basically vet the the fact that it's uh, there is a high abandonment rate, um, and and so I will do my homework and go back and actually get that. And maybe one of the things I'll do for my next marketing land article is um, focus on that. But I have seen that um, last time I checked, I want to say it's somewhere you know north of fifty percent. You know, probably closer to 75% in terms of when you don't have a mobily optimized experience. You know, people come in, especially I think anyone that's older, right? I'm 45 and I, I'm blessed to have pretty good eyesight, but you know, this is that point where it starts to go downhill that, you know, you come in and there's that less than two point type, um, or it's really hard to find and you have to sort of like pinch in and pinch out. It ends up not being a very clean and clear experience. And I think you know, with the whole heart bleed issue this week, that big bug and, you know, people being a little bit more skeptical about passwords and all that, you know, it's just one more thing that I think makes it difficult and makes it um, harder to navigate. So it really becomes that much more critical to focus on having that optimized experience so that, you know, if you are going to get them to do something with you in the online or the mobile channel, that um, it really is as easy as possible. The user experience is different as well. How I tend to use a website or an application may vary a lot from someone in a different demographic or a different age group. And you, you and I have talked about this idea of, of somebody in their, you know, over 100, which I don't know, you know, how likely they are going to be using uh, their mobile apps. But, you know, my grandmother's in her mid-90s and her application, the way she uses a website would be completely different perhaps than maybe uh, someone a much younger age 
maybe a millennial, maybe somebody in high school. How do you approach that from a marketing standpoint to make sure that you're developing the user case to fit, um, you know, one mobile application? Yeah, so I think Frank touched on it in terms of all this great data we have. Uh, so there's the quantitative data, and it's something we here at WCG, part of W2O Group, really focus on is all of that quantitative web and social data. Um, the real key is, is sort of using that to inform your strategy and then having UI or UX experts, right, usually a combination of both, that's user interface, user ex um, experience. And a lot of times it's actually walking through people once you start to build prototypes of things or, or having wireframes and having them navigate and do things like eye tracking studies or watching them from a qualitative perspective and you know seeing how they're interacting. And I think my thesis is that I have a six-year-old and I also have a you know grandmother that's uh, in her 90s that the ability for them intuitively, and that's a critical word, intuitively, know sort of how to go in and you know go to the next phase or drill down or find something it really has to be stupid simple so i think we are getting to an age where like the latest iteration of apple's ios their operating system started to slim things down and make it cleaner and clearer versus more complicated and more sort of design so ironically in this age of anything's possible i'm seeing marketing and design move to more of a sort of less is more stripped down state uh, and, and really sort of making it intuitive so that if you are clicking on a screen or swiping on a screen that you sort of understand exactly where things should be and how they operate. How do you stay on top of um, Facebook now with their changing advertising, Pinterest, who's also got some changes headed um, that's going to impact from a social standpoint? How do you approach that for each one of your clients? Well, we're lucky to have, you know, 400 employees and a lot of the employees that are here are uh, really smart, you know, people like Michael, Michael Brito and Adam Cohen, Paul Dyer, and they all are sort of sub subject matter experts in and of their own right. So we sort of make it our sort of job to do that, stay in touch with our partners at these different um, social networks. Uh, I also read incessantly. I have some pretty good Twitter lists that I pay attention to, you know, people like Frank Eliason. Uh, others that are sort of putting out information, HubSpot, looking at what they're talking about and how you know the the things interrelate. So I think it's it's hard to stay on top because it does move so quickly. Um, in the mobile space, I think the thing for me is writing this marketing land column about mobile and location based marketing forces me to really sort of stay sharp in terms of you know what's new, what's next, what are people's opinions, and how are they reacting to what I'm putting out there. So I think the last thing I'll say is. You know, anybody that needs to stay in touch with this space, uh, blogging about it, putting it in front of your customers, your peers, your ecosystem, and then getting them to react can be a really critical way to sort of make sure, A, you're uh, putting the right information out there, but B, that you're also getting any sort of nuanced feedback. So clients can say, oh, you know, that's great, except, you know, we use uh, IE7 in our organization, so this presents a whole different set of challenges, you know, if you're looking at something like Pinterest. Okay. I love Pinterest. I'm a pinner. I think uh, our good, our mutual friend, uh, Mike Schneider, called me a pinning ninja. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I aspire to be my Pinterest. Um, uh, but location, you know, not everybody participates in location or they aren't knowingly always participate. I think, you know, we, our location is always tracked if we're using any sort of mobile device or any sort of smartphone. And that's it, really important for businesses, but we still don't do it really well. I think contextual targeting, you know, I look at a sofa and a year later, I'm still getting, you know, um, you know, contextual targeting to go back and buy another sofa. Um, I don't need one. So how come we aren't getting better at that? You wrote a book on location-based software for dummies with Mike, and we have been following Foursquare, who's now partnering and doing some things with Microsoft. Um, Josh, who, uh, Josh Williams, a friend of ours, you know, went to work for Facebook after he sold uh, Gowalla to Facebook. He's left since and is working on a new project. We hope to have him on soon. Where, what has happened since you've written the book to today, how important is really looking at locations separately other than it just being included in the technology that your customers are using? 
So one of the things that Mike and I did well, I think, is um, one, we tried to keep the book at a high level because we knew that we were at the very early stages of what location-based marketing meant. I mean, we started to write this book in 2010 and finished it in 2011, which feels like a century ago. Um, we did bet hard on Foursquare, which I think was good. We also bet hard on things like Facebook and Google, which, you know, lo and behold, have become the sort of de facto location players. Um, Yelp has certainly done, you know, a good job in this space. But I think the key is, is that as we predicted, location has become a much more passive activity. And I think, you know, to Frank's earlier point again about the data, knowing where someone is when they're doing something and how they're doing it can be critical. And so the good news is there's a whole treasure trove of new technologies that are coming out that allow for in-store interaction. So low energy Bluetooth, um, using the magnetic fields within the store, Wi-Fi, things like that to be able to message to people. I think one of the things that's critical, and this is the challenge that marketers have always had, is being able to get discreet enough with that data. You know, as Frank mentioned, that um, it's not a one size fits all, and sometimes you can have uh, these segments of audiences, but inevitably people may always want to be treated like individuals. So the good news is we have more data than we've ever had. We're starting to have some mechanisms to be able to connect the dots, but I still think we're another three to five years away from really doing this stuff well. Uh, even though you'll start to see, you know, like Apple, Apple is starting to do more with their iBeacon in the store, but, you know, we're really at the tip of the iceberg in terms of unlocking the real power of location-based uh, uh, data to, to translate into better marketing and customer experience. Okay, Aaron, you've been running a lot. I've been following you on Facebook and keeping up with your health and fitness movement that you have. What I speculate, I think I know the answer to this, but what is your favorite app? So it's really a combination. So Map My Run, uh, which is part of the Map My Fitness uh, trio there. They sit here in Austin, Texas. Uh, I run with my phone on my arm every single day. And so they track my distance and my time and all that, uh, which is really helpful. And then I also use my Jawbone Up, which tracks sleep and my steps. And, and so uh, my Up app are really sort of my two favorite uh, fitness apps. And, you know, this is another thing I've talked a little bit about, but, you know, lots more to come in terms of wearables and or data that sort of results from these health metrics. I think uh, so much possibility there. I'm excited. I think you told me that you're looking for a marathon or a race to participate in. And so I'll be happy to watch that and cheer you on uh, from the sidelines, of course. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, um, Thanks a lot for coming on. Also, uh, Frank Eliason, um, what's your favorite app? Is it the city? Is it, is it the city app, or is it all about the money? Show me the it's money. It's all about the money. <laughs> Absolutely, it's all about managing my finances. That I also like things that you know, make my life easier. You know, uh, things like the Wemo, where you can light power your lights and do different things like that. I think that the apps we choose to have on our device center on what makes our life easier, not you know, having every app under the sun. I think that's, you know, for me, I concentrate on things that, you know, add interest to me, uh, how I manage things. I do like news, so a lot of news apps as well. Okay, well, I um, I know that today is the day that everybody can buy Google Glass. Are you, either one of you mm -hmm. Google Glass uh, wearers? Uh, I own Google Glass. I wouldn't call myself a wearer. <laughs> what about I you, tried Aaron? I've tried Robert Scoble's a few times, and uh, it's interesting. I don't know as though I think probably the, the iteration that will be out, you know, maybe 12 to 18 months from now might be the one I'd be more interested in. Still a little geeky for me. Yeah, don't wear it in San Francisco, right? That's kind of Exactly. <laughs> to like, me, Google Glass is, is more about here's the life I lead, uh, whereas I actually like the watches. I have the Samsung watch. I think that is more of a consumption device to give me information that is important to me. And I'm looking forward to the iPhone uh, version of that that comes out hopefully this year, rumored. Well, I want to thank you, Frank, for coming on the show. I'm really excited about what you're doing. And we'll have to get you to share your insights in this whole Comcast Time Warner deal next time we have you on. And thank you, Aaron, for joining us as well. I know you're super busy. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy some of that great Texas barbecue today. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, guys. That was uh, Marketing Mavericks. We're going to wrap that up and let you get to um, our next scheduled programming. But, you know, I want to hear from you. I want to hear what you think, who you think are, should be our guests. You can follow me by going to hashtag Marketing Mavericks on Twitter or tweet me personally at, at Tanya Hall Radio. Or, you know what? Old school. Email me at mavericks at twit.tv. 
That's a wrap. And thanks for joining us for today's show. We'll talk to you next week.